we'll have special guests from the cast and crew of The Wheel of Time. Plus, we'll be sharing behind the scenes footage and geeking out about episode seven with our fellow Wheel of Time fans. And don't forget, stick around for a look at next week's episode. Welcome to Amazon's official after show, Inside the Wheel of Time. I'm your host and innkeeper, Matt Hatch. Damn, the dragon was reborn. Let's get inside episode seven. A pregnant Aiel maiden dances the spears. Nynaeve shields her escape from the black wind. A ring of gold, a white flame, and golden eyes. Min shares her viewings. Ran believes he is the dragon reborn, and he and Moraine enter the blight alone. Will they survive the eye of the world? And will their friends find them in time? Into the shadow, with teeth bared, we go. And what was that? Episode 7, let's break it down. I'm so glad to have Daniel, Rhythma, and Critter with me to talk about what just happened with that Aiel at the beginning of this episode. And so let's just jump into it. Best cold open of the season so far. I'm obsessed. We saw part of it. We saw hints of it in the trailers and everyone was like, is that an Aiel? It's got to be an Aiel. There's the spears. And the fact that we got to see not just an Aiel, but that Aiel giving birth while absolutely wrecking everybody that comes into her way. It was so awesome. So first she goes and then she goes and it's just great. (laughs) There's people dying and there's a person coming out of her and doesn't slow her down and it's an absolutely sensational introduction to what exactly the Aiel should be because in the books it's quite explicit that one Aiel is worth a whole lot of normal people so we have these guys in their noble regalia heavy armor just being pulled to the floor and destroyed and a very wise woman once said no capes and we explicitly saw why that remains true even outside of the superhero (laughs) realm it's so much fun and it's the first time this show actually got me to stand up and just rewind and watch again and again and again because it was just sick yeah i absolutely love this scene like daniel said the Aiel are singular in their just ability to fight and that is something that comes through a lot in the books and i can't imagine a better scene than this i think we should tackle the end of episode seven standing over her as she's giving birth to this child we find out is Tam Althor. What was your reaction to that moment? I was so happy. Honestly, I wanted to find out in the first episode because in the book, you find out pretty early that there's something going on with Rand's birth because Tam had those like ravings as Rand was bringing him back to the town and the two rivers. And it didn't happen in the first episode. And I was like, what's going on? Like, I is when is it happening? You know, it's like, that's when Rand starts to doubt himself and wonder, you know, is Tam my actual father? And then finally in this episode, it happened. We found out that Tam found Rand. It wasn't Tam's wife that gave birth to him. It was some Aiel who died, not in the process, but I guess right after she gave birth to him. Talk about a tragic backstory. It explains where the red hair came from, which everyone's been commenting on. It explains Loyal uh, remarking on his looks and calling him an Aiel. Turns out he is one. It was so exciting for me to see something that I thought was just not going to happen in the show. And then it, and then it did happen. And it just, I just had to wait till episode seven. Other than just that amazing cold open and that story, the storyline of Rand coming to accept or believe that he's the dragon reborn, what else kind of stuck out to you in episode seven? But yeah, Lan and Nynaeve have been flirting with each other pretty heavily up until this point. Lots of lingering glances and lots of just tension between the two of them. And to see them finally come together was really satisfying. And I just really appreciated the shot of Daniel Henny without his shirt on. Just gonna say that. (laughs) They do have that moment afterwards where she gets to know a little bit more about why he's been called Daishan. Mad props to Nynaeve for bagging not only a warder, but a king. I know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Good for her. It makes Lan so much sexier that he is a king, but he's still able to, like, accede authority to a woman. Like, that is just the sexiest thing a man can do. I love Lan. <laughs> Sorry. I don't want to turn this into a yeah, Lan thirst episode, but... Don't worry. Daniel Henney is going to watch this, and you might meet him in life, so just... <laughs> Daniel Henney, if you're watching this, log off right now. This is not for you. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like this episode was all about the relationships. It was kind of the, uh, other than the incredible cold open, it was build up for what comes next. And so, you know, Lan and Nynaeve was fabulous. 
I loved the Rand Egwene moment whenever she comes out and he like knows her and he's like, I know that whenever you're ready to talk, you always come find me. Mm -hmm. And basically I just <laughs> felt fluffy that whole time. My favorite quote was when Rand said, every Aes Sedai needs a warder. Do you think I'd let Aww. someone else be yours? I literally just died a little bit. I was just like, oh God, I didn't know that I would love them so much, but I love them so much. And also the surprise love triangle. I guess it's not like a surprise because they kind of, you know, they like hinted at it um, throughout the show, but it's not the thing that happens in the books as much. Whenever Nynaeve just called it out, I was like, oh dang, they're really going there with this love triangle. Even though, yeah, I'm just fully team Rand Egwene. So there wasn't much uh, drama there for me because I knew who she was going to pick. And now one of the new characters, though, one of the new performances come up here is Min. What was your reaction to finally meeting Min here? Min is one of my favorite Wheel of Time characters. This is probably one of the most accurate interpretations of a character from a book we've seen so far, especially her visions. It's exactly how I've always seen it in the books, these kind of mirror images floating above people. So I'm thrilled they went that way. And the performance behind it is just that clever not snarky just more cutting attitude that she has i find to be but much needed when, when you're dealing with stubborn sheep herders uh, a welcome presence of someone who's got that new yorker-esque kind of view on the world i found to be well fitting and uh, a refreshing breeze <laughs> compared to a lot of these country bumpkins who have been steering the ship so far it also leads into my favorite quote of the episode which is the brooding one where maureen cuts in and goes they're all brooding <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah she's like the one on the left <laughs> feels good i think she looks great i think her attitude is perfect i really liked her conversation with rand it felt like he was a whole different person when he was around her versus when he's around hmm. anybody else. I thought they had some some kind of chemistry in a way. And how she kind of danced around answering his questions and Moraine's questions was very min. I think she's a lot of people's favorite or near favorite character and and i'm really excited to see more from her rhythm how, how, was, how did you feel about like finally getting to fall dara and meeting some of these characters you'd read about i just have to say i was i loved the little detail where she just always like poured a drink anytime someone asked her something and then she like gave them a drink because she's like are you sure you want to know <laughs> but yeah fall dara was fantastic <laughs> And I think Lord Agelmar, he's definitely slightly different from the books. There's a little tension there with him and the yeah. White Tower, which is interesting. It just kind of points to what Loghain was saying earlier with how, you know, far away from the White Tower, people kind of are starting to maybe not mm. respect the Aes Sedai as much or not, um, you know, understand their power or seek their help. And I think it's kind of pointing to some tensions between the White Tower and the rest of the world. And yeah, just some cracks within the White Tower's power. How did you approach the difficult decisions that Egwene makes around like destiny, duty, and love? And what do you hope that viewers will, will think about Egwene's decisions? I think she has an incredible sense of duty and believes in destiny and feels that she is destined for something greater than what her life would be in the two rivers. And that comes at a massive cost, you know, and a lot of sacrifice. She depends on the people like Nynaeve to help her through those tough decisions. And that's very similar to, you know, I feel like Zoe and my relationship in real life. We are so there for each other and depend on each other. But I hope that fans will have a bit more insight into her decisions and uh, why she does the things that she does. But, you know, she wants to change the world. She's willing to make those sacrifices to, to, you know, leave the world in a better place than she found it. Uh, where are we today? What are we doing? <laughs> This is so beautiful. This is home. Yeah. It's crazy. It's like exactly yeah. how I imagined it. Yeah. <laughs> Me and Zoe, we're like sisters and that's been something really beautiful. It's really important that the Nynaeve and Egwene relationship is really strong and that's exactly what it's like in real life. Be strong, Egwene. It's all super surreal. I mean, it still is. We've undergone horse riding, weapon training, stunts. It was pretty grueling for the first month. And action! It's crazy that that's our job, you know? The stunt team are incredible. They make us look amazing. Like, I can just go like, eh, and they'll die. <laughs> we definitely bring out different things in each other, but we're all just like massive goofballs. God. Thanks, so guys. Really Thank you. Oh, Lunch time. Oh. 
I'm joined by Julian Perry, the VFX supervisor on The Wheel of Time on Amazon Prime. Julian, thank you for sitting down with us today. Hi, Dusty Wheel. <laughs> appreciate that. And I'm sure all the fans are, are saying hi right back. I mean, why don't we jump into this? How do you go about tackling a world and a project of this size when it comes to The Wheel of Time? As your fans will know, it's all there on the page. It's transferring people's imaginations from what they've been reading for however many years it's been <laughs> and just hopefully facilitating that imagination that they've formed in their head. You've got to be supplying that to the audience. That's something that was front and centre with Rafe and all of the filmmakers that scope was the main mantra for the show was just get out there and just show this amazing world. What are the techniques you use from an effects standpoint so you can make sure that you capture that scope? When you're out in the, in the countryside, you just have it immediately. I'm just kind of curious, how do you bring that to life from an effects standpoint? With this particular project, because uh, the production team had found some amazing land, uh, landscapes, locations, we come in because, you know, you go to a, a Slovenian location which looks absolutely amazing, but you've got a 21st century car park in the background. <laughs> right, right, right. You're taking away things like pylons, little paths that maybe the tourists have made, other sort of real world things like fences. For the environments and the landscapes, VFX were there to underpin or support what was already there in camera. And as Rafe has explained, lots of it is all in camera. Towards the end of the season, we were struck by COVID. And the world was sure. closed down. How do we carry on shooting and maintain the scope? We're all going as a production to the Canary Islands for the, uh, the last couple of episodes. None of the crew could go to the Canaries, but we were lucky enough mm. to have uh, a splinter unit visit the Canary Islands and photograph the Canaries. Gotcha. We managed to then bring that back into post-production and working with our great vendors, we managed to drop our drama into these locations. The environments that you're seeing there are, for want of a better word, real, but at the same time, a VFX fabrication. And the blight, I love the blight. I hasten to add, everyone was really happy with the blight in the sense that people said, we're really happy we didn't go to the original location because <laughs> the blight is better. When it comes to bringing Trollocs to life from an effects standpoint, or even Fades or other creatures in this story, what's that process been like? The Fades seem to be hitting the mark for, for most people, and same with the Trollocs. With the Trollocs, as Rafe has explained, he wanted a lot of this all in camera. And that's fine, because with the Trollocs, to go the prosthetic route, you're looking at, say, 20 good on-screen Trollocs. In the battle sequence in episode one, it gets very busy with Trolloc action. It's a really good combination of on-set Trollocs and our CGI Trollocs. You're going to be slightly amazed to what is real and what isn't, in the same way that we were. Believe it or not, it's pretty straightforward. You just shoot with the Trollocs you've got. You sort of photograph them, stack them in ways that predominantly your real Trollocs in the front and then all of your background Trollocs will be the CGI augmentations. There's obviously other occasions where those Trollocs need to be entirely CGI because they're doing things that would be probably dangerous to do on set. Towards the end of the season we just because of Covid regulations weren't allowed to bring the Trollocs um, back out. So for the most part everything is um, CGI from everything that you've done, what's been your personal favorite effect that we see on screen? I think it's got to be the Trollocs and the Fades. With the Fades, for example, it was really crucial to have this kind of slug skin. We went into research and development on all of the effects that you see. The show is a, is a monster, literally, from VFX numbers. It's well and truly into the three and a half thousand. Wow. Each one of our shots is key. It's great to design creatures. I love getting involved in that aspect. You know, it's pure imagination. Again, driven by, as I, as I mentioned before, lots of book reference on the creatures and how disgusting they were and just how mixed up they were being half human, half beasts. Yeah, we had a lot of fun with it. Well, Julian, thank you so much for being here with us. I really appreciate just this little peek that we've gotten into what's clearly been so much work. Just a shout out quickly, how many people were involved on the effects of the Wheel of Time. I've easily in excess of 350. Wow. Well, to all of them, thank you very much. Thank you for joining us inside the Wheel of Time.
I got to experience firsthand supervising everything in the first world that the story takes place down to the smallest detail. What is the graving looking like on Egwene's dagger? He has a sword and he has a cantana. Down to the last button and stitching on the costumes and the jewelry that's being worn. It's just a lot. Experience the origins of the Wheel of Time with exclusive animated bonus content from Prime Video X-Ray and see how the world broke. Simply press up on your Fire TV remote to have access to X-Ray or by tapping on your mobile device. Each episode is an expansive backstory in the Wheel of Time that must be seen to know the whole truth. the Wheel of Time series and its origin stories with X-Ray. Right now I'm sitting down with makeup effects designer Nick Dudman. Nick, thank you very much for joining us. How are you doing today? I'm good. It's a pleasure to meet you. Yeah, you too. I, I really appreciate this. Now, you've worked on some storied franchises. What was the key for you when it came to making Trollocs only be and kind of come to life in the Wheel of Time world? I think with the Trolloc design, the key things that emerged were, you knew from the books, these are hybrids of humans and animals. They're not orcs, they're not goblins, they're not werewolves, they have to have something unique. And I wanted them to be as big as you could make them practically. What it led to was an approach that I suggested at the beginning, which was instead of sculpting 25 different complete creatures, can we do this in a modular way? Pretty much all the Trollocs are horned. So we sculpted six or seven different types of horn, and we had different sorts of prosthetic makeups and pull-on heads, but we made everything interconnect, and they all clipped in magnetically using rare earth magnets. So any pair of horns would fit any sculpt. So you could film a Trolloc at night and then you could run in and whip his horns off and chuck another pair of horns on or even take the original horns and swap them and turn them upside down, anything you like. And in silhouette and in mid-shot, you have a different Trolloc. Then if you have a, a shot where you want more expression in the face, do it digitally, in post, controlled. And doing that yeah. actually worked great because this kind of gag, in my experience, always works best if you mix up the methods. You're never quite sure what you're looking at, and you stop trying to analyze it and just get on with enjoying what you're seeing. How much do those suits weigh that they're, that the Trollocs, that the stunt uh, people are wearing? It would depend on the Trolloc, but I would estimate probably around 20 to 35 kilos. The major equation is how does it move? Is he able to move it so it just moves like muscles and not just a wetsuit? You're trying to emulate fake musculature, but you're also thinking of all the practical things of how much can the guy carry? If he's carrying weight, where is it being held? If he's on stilts, where's his center of gravity? Because if there's too much suit out the front, will it pull him over? If there's too much at the back, will he fall backwards? In the hope that when you reach the set, although you've got this really complicated amount of stuff on someone compared to somebody who's just wearing a suit. But as far as the first AD and the director are concerned, they can just direct them, you know, r without having to go to too much effort. Behind the scenes, all hell's breaking loose. You know, if you've got 20 Trollocs on set, there's nearly 60 people looking after them. Were there other makeup effects that you loved bringing to life on the screen for this world? Oh, yeah. I mean, there's, there's lots of things. I mean, you're very often having to do dummies of people because of the fact it's not safe for an actor to do it, or even a stuntman, or the character has to lie dead on the ground for, you know, three days, and that's just not fair. Or indeed things like um, bodies being carried on horseback. We had dummies of most of the key cast at some point, and trying to do hyper-realistic 
um, dummies of people where every hair, every eyebrow is punched in. You know, that's a cool thing to do. I've always enjoyed doing that. And of course, we often do um, animal things. We don't do anything that involves damaging a real animal. You know, right. the humane societies always want proof of that. So it's always actually rather strangely satisfying if somebody phones up and says, oh, we've just seen this, you know, we want the proof of the fact that it isn't real sheep. And you think, we won. <laughs> then, you know, that's great. And there were quite a few sort of dead animal things to do, um, which are fun. You know, but the bulk of the stuff at the beginning was, um, was Trollocs. It, you know, that was the first build to get done and then it, it did ease up a bit once we'd actually got the hang of that and we were doing fade things and dummy fades and you know dummy trollocs and all, all manner of stuff oh now i want i want to i want a dummy fade in my house now <laughs> i think you've you've just convinced all of the wheel of time fans out there that they know what they want to buy for christmas this year for, for their for their family members i love that thank you so much for sitting down with us today it's it's been a pleasure to get to know you oh, thank you very much it's a joy we are on uh, the back lot here at Jordan Studios. I've never seen anything like this. It's amazing. It's not lost on any of us how much uh, people love these characters. It was such a massive undertaking. This character who is just beloved by so many people. As an Asian actor, I never thought I'd have a chance to do something like this in my life. The entire cast has been amazing been very, very fulfilling on many levels. It's going to be overwhelmingly positive from the fan base. The world is being made for them. This is the little kid dream right here. There is a part that I don't understand here. I want to hear your theories about this. We have Pat and Fane come out of the way gate. We've just seen it takes an Aes Sedai. What's your theory on how Pat and Fane's getting in and out of this place? I have absolutely no clue. We know there's Trollocs in the ways, so Pat and Fane, he's a slippery little duck. That's what I'll say right now. He's a, he's a greased up little yeah. fowl, and I want to know how he's getting from place to place because I don't think he's got wings. Critter, did you have any thoughts on this? Were you surprised to see him just kind of saunter out of the way gate after them? As a book reader, no. In the context of the show, <laughs> yes, absolutely. Maybe he took an Uber. <laughs> <laughs> this episode ends, I think, on a shocking note. Rand and Moraine leaving everyone behind and entering the blight to go to the eye of the world. What is it you kind of anticipate or hope or speculate might be happening here when it comes to Rand and Moraine and the eye of the world? I'm not sure what to think. Is the dark one yeah. up there or is this just subterfuge? Is this a trap? You know, I'm really nervous. I'm glad, but also not glad that not everyone is going because obviously I wouldn't want them to be in danger. The fact that it's just those two feels like they're, they're putting them, you know, the dragon reborn in even more danger than he needs to be in. So I love the fact that this is about to go down up at the eye of the world. And, and I can't wait to see how, how it all goes down and, and finally maybe see Rand come into his own. Now that we, now that we know what he's been up to this whole time. We have one episode left, Daniel, one episode of season one of the wheel of time on Amazon prime. You saw the end of this one. You saw them walk into the blight. What are you thinking at this moment? How are you feeling as a fan? I'm a little confused at what the plan is at this point. I'm hoping that comes a little bit clearer in the next episode. But for me, uh, knowing the dangers of the blight, it does make a little more sense to minimize how big the party moving through this land is because it's not welcoming. If you didn't catch it from the aesthetic, this place isn't where, you know, you just go for a stroll. And I'm really excited to see how the show's going to make the blight feel so dangerous the next episode. Thematically, like we've kind of been building up to this with Moraine showing once, like time and time again, that she's willing to put herself in danger. It kind of makes sense that it's just Moraine and Rand at this point. And it felt right almost in a way. And yeah, mm -hmm. I think watching them walk into the blight, which we have no idea what's going to go, go down, it felt pretty fitting as the sort of penultimate episode of the of the wheel of time i'm really jazzed about it like i've been really jazzed to see 
everything that's happened. Part of me wasn't sure they were even going to get to the Eye of the World this season. And so the fact that they have and and we just we don't know exactly what to expect up there. It makes me, as I said, nervous, but really excited. And also I'm just wondering, you know, Egwene and Lan and Nynaeve, they're not the type of people to just sit back, you know? So what are they going to do? And yeah, basically I'm just pumped. If I don't get more Aiel soon, I might cry. I was like, can we just skip and a couple books? <laughs> <That's> <laughs> right. I, I, like, I just, I just want to see some more Aiel. That's basically where I was at. Rhythma, how about for you? When is season two coming out? I need it now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for joining us on this journey to the final episode. I can't wait. We'll have all have seen it and we'll all get to sit back and just talk about how it ended how we thought it was going to end. And like you said, Ritima, when's season two? <laughs> that's, that's the question I'm already asking myself. <laughs> Thank you, Daniel Critter and Ritima for being here and breaking down episode seven with us. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye. And to all my guests, thank you for sharing your experiences with us. Now, here's a look at what's to come in our season finale of The Wheel of Time. With Moraine and Ran entering the Blight alone and the Dark One's forces marching on Tarwin's Gap, will their friends follow them into the Blight? What is Pat and Fane up to? Will Faldara finally fall? And will the Dragon Reborn defeat the Dark One? We'll find out this Friday when the season finale of The Wheel of Time drops. Don't forget to hashtag your reactions throughout the season and we'll do our best to feature your comments in next week's episode. And here is what you all had to say. Sash V tweeted, Min, I've been waiting for this moment and it's finally here. Min is one of my all-time favorite book characters and Kai Alexander is perfection. Ditto, from pouring a drink every time Maureen asked her a question to the sarcasm and the viewings, Kai Alexander brought Min to life. And now, I just want to visit Min's bar in Faldara. JB Von Pressing tweeted, The cold open for episode seven of The Wheel of Time is easily a top three fight scene of all time for a TV show. Easily. Yeah, JB, absolutely. It's one of my favorite scenes ever filmed. It was so gloriously cinematic. I watched it over and over again. The Benji Blanco tweeted, The Wheel of Time episode seven was fantastic. The best opener I've seen. The sheer violence it depicted was incredible. The tension between our group members was done well and the reveal at the end, in my opinion, was done so elegantly. One more episode left, let's go. Benji, I couldn't help myself from counting down the minutes left in episode seven. It was so jam packed from start to finish and ended with a bang. Bring on the eye of the world. That's it my friends. I can't wait to see your reactions and share what you had to say about how it all ends. And be back here next Tuesday for a special final episode chatting with the cast and crew. I'm your host and innkeeper, Matt Hatch. Thank you for joining us inside the Wheel of Time. Match. Whoa, oh my God. I see the See you later. We have to try everything. Drink. Hello. Hello. I don't care about the show. I just want a good blooper reel. I want to learn <laughs> science. <laughs> you guys are going to make me look like I'm in the show, right? You're going to put in the effects. Replace the green. I don't want to look like an asshole. Sorry. <laughs>